all stand and worship with us. certainly try to take care of those needs. And I believe we have some visitors that are watching online too, folks that are not a member of our church. And so if you have a need, let us know at the church office and we'll certainly try to help you with your needs as well. Uh, again, we're glad that you're here to worship. I wanted to mention the flowers this morning. Uh, they were placed by Rex and Kay Keaton and they are in honor of their children, Ryan and Alana and their grandchildren, Ava and Josie. And uh, Kay was explaining to me uh, Ryan, that this is kind of like a homecoming flower arrangement for y'all. Ryan and Elena left 
several years, and I didn't confirm the, the timeline, but uh, they were members of our church. They left and went to Nanawaya, and they left there and went up to Tupelo. Well, <laughs> now, wasn't that, <laughs> y'all, get, y'all get together later, okay? Uh, <laughs> left there, went up to Tupelo a few years, and then they came back uh, to Pelahatchee and uh, got started back in church, and then COVID hit. And so that threw things all off for them. And so, uh, uh, Kay said that uh, these flowers are kind of homecoming flowers. Uh, all those moving or all that moving around, Ryan said, I'm not going to move my letter because we're going to make it home someday. And so we're glad that y'all made it home, yeah. and we're glad to see you today. Yeah. Uh, I want to leave us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to continue in our time of worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity that you've given us to get up this morning, uh, to get dressed, to, to be here at church. <laughs> We pray, Father, that uh, every, everybody who is here, everybody who's watching online, Lord, that we would all take advantage of this wonderful opportunity we have to sing praises to your name, to worship you for who you are. And we're so grateful that because of who you are, we are allowed to know you in your, uh, in, in, and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would accept our efforts to do so now, as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And the words to the chorus of this song say, your praise will ever be on my lips. We're to give the Lord praise in everything. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let's read these words to this psalm together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Let's stand together as we worship.
drove to River Oaks Hospital for what we thought was going to be the normal birth of our second child. We got checked in. Michelle was set up to be induced. And we were planning on a normal delivery, but that wasn't what was going to happen. There were some problems. The doctor made the decision to rush Michelle in for an emergency C-section. It got crazy real quick. As things went on, surgery happened baby came out blue as a smurf and was rushed into the ICU. They took me back to our hospital room while they continued to work on Michelle and I sat there alone in the hospital room with my mind racing as to what was going on, wondering if we were about to lose our baby. And I tell you this, as people, we do a lot of things on our own. We think we can handle just about anything that comes our way. But it was at that moment that the truth became very real to me. There are just some things in this world and in this life that we have absolutely no control over. And at that moment, that baby was going to need a procedure done on his heart that night if he was going to survive through the night. So I can't describe to you the thought of helplessness on our part. But I do want to say this. Jesus Christ is the way maker. He 
put us in the right place and provided a doctor who was able to immediately and accurately diagnose a very rare heart condition. He put EMTs and law enforcement officers in the right place at the right time to plow through rush hour traffic on Lakeland Drive on a Friday afternoon to get to UMMC. He put Michelle's cousin on call as a neonatal nurse practitioner at UMMC when they got the call we were coming. He put on the heart of another nurse to call her husband who, in my opinion, is the best pediatric cardiologist around. And he was at home. He wasn't on call. But she called him and said, you've got to come in and do this surgical procedure or this child's not going to make it. He came in to tear a hole through this baby's heart so this baby had a chance of survival to get to Ohio. And that cardiologist is still our hero. He put pilots, flight nurses, and a medical jet from UAB on the ground in Jackson to take the baby and Michelle to Cleveland. He made a way financially for me to go to Cleveland. I'd never been on an airplane. Didn't know what I was doing, but he made a way. He provided a way for my sister to go with me, for my father-in-law to be able to come up there and meet us as well. He provided a pediatric heart surgeon from Australia to do open heart surgery on my child. He provided a chaplain in Ohio who was the father of someone my dad worked with to come and be with us in the hospital during hours of surgery. And well, after all of that and so much more, Lord has proven faithful to his word because that blue little baby wearing a blue shirt is now a healthy 16 year old boy who loves the Lord and gave his life to Jesus so remember this the answer is not always yes sometimes the answer is no because God's will is different than what our will is God has a purpose and a plan for everything no matter what it is, the good and the bad, he has a plan. But remember this, always remember this, he is the one in control. He is the way maker, he's the miracle worker, he's the promise keeper, he's the light in the darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Let's stand worship the Lord, the way maker who loves you so much.
way for us through those difficult moments as Brother Byron described we know you're there in those joyful moments our hearts are glad you're there to rejoice with us we're grateful Father that we don't have to figure out by ourselves how to go through those difficult moments from time to time, uh, we have the opportunity to have Brother B uh, Vic Bowman here at the church. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time he comes is for somebody's funeral. Uh, he was here a few weeks ago, the last time, for Jodell Thompson's funeral. Brother Vic served as pastor at Crossroads from 1974 to 1984. And there are still some folks here, a lot of you were don't know Brother Vic, or you weren't here when, when he was here in those times. That's 37 years ago since he served as pastor at Crossroads. But the folks that were here when Brother Vic was here still love Brother Vic. And, and that's a good thing. I'm glad they do. Uh, and I tell him so every time that, that he comes, that I'm glad that, that there are good memories of his time as pastor of this church. I hear other uh, members sometimes talk about Brother Wayne Crenshaw. Uh, Brother Wayne was a pastor of Crossroads when this building was built. And he led the church in that historic walk as they began that day of, uh, uh, over in the old uh, building and walked across the way into this new sanctuary. Uh, people talk about Brother Bobby Smith and uh, Brother Brian Hill. And uh, they all have a place in the hearts of some of our folks. Uh, since it was organized in 1916, 32 different men have had the privilege of serving as a pastor of Crossroads Baptist Church. And I'm sure that each one left their mark in the history book of the church. And each pastor uh, that has served through the years left his mark on your life as well. I can remember several of the pastors that served uh, at Scuba Baptist Church when I was growing up. Uh, I remember Brother Jack Palmer was a pastor when I was baptized at about age seven or eight, uh, about 60 years ago. And I can still remember, I can visualize Brother Jack. I used to wonder, you know, during that last song, the, the, the choir special or whatever, before he got up to preach, I always noticed he, he would, he, back then, you know, had the big throne chairs that the pastor sat, sat in, and he would sit up there, and he would have his head down, and, and I remember thinking as a seven or eight-year-old, he's trying to decide what he wants to say when he stands up. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I sit here during that last song before I get up, and I have a prayer, too, uh, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say. No, it's not that. I'm, 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 asking, the, I'm asking God to bless what he's laid on my heart. Uh, I can remember Brother Her Herbert Fr uh, Frith, Brother Tommy Badley, Brother Harold Harris, and Brother Jack Winscott, men who I can remember as a child and as a youth because I, I left when Brother Jack was there to go to college and was never a member there again. Uh, I can't point to anything really specific about any one of those men, or the thing, something they said in a sermon or anything like that. But I do know because they were my pastor and they loved me. 
And they had my best interest in their hearts that they left a mark on my life. Uh, there are those of you who came to Crossroads from, from other churches, and you probably got fond memories of pastors that you had on previous uh, times in the churches that you were in before coming here. And it's perfectly fine to remember each one and the contributions they made to your church and the contributions they made to your life. And every person is going to have a pastor that you're particularly fond of, that you remember something about that man, uh, maybe above the others. In the passage that we're going to study today, that's what was going on at the church at Corinth. We're going to start reading uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 11 and 12. And this is going to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. That was Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. Now, it seems that the members of the church at Corinth all had their favorite pastor. And some seem to say, I don't like any of those guys. I'm going to hang with Christ. Now, as I've already said, it's certainly acceptable to be fond of a pastor, to have good memories of a pastor. But what was happening at Corinth is not acceptable. They were allowing their preferences among the pastors to cause divisions in the church. And that's never acceptable. So apparently this dispute carried on because Paul addressed it again in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. And that's where our, our message is actually going to come from this morning. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 4. And Paul writes, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are they not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you, can, you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Now, let me give you a little bit of historical perspective on what was going on here. Uh, Paul had visited Corinth on his second missionary journey. And we have a record of that in Acts chapter 18. You can go back there later and read in chapter 18 of Acts, and you'll see uh, how Paul ended up there in Corinth. Uh, it was there that he met Aquila and Priscilla. These were a married couple, and they were tent makers, as Paul was, and so he made friends with them, probably stayed in their home, and he stayed in Corinth about a year and a half. And he started the church there. He started a church a Christian church, a church that, that believed and followed Christ during that year and a half that he was in Corinth on that first trip. Later, Apollos showed up. Uh, he was a good speaker. He had a clear understanding of who Christ was, and he boldly spoke about Christ to the church. Paul left Apollos there in Corinth uh, with the church, and he went back to Ephesus to check on the church that he had started there. And so we see that Paul established a church at Corinth, and then uh, just before he left there, after getting things going, Apollos came in to lead the church, to teach the new believers what it meant to know and follow Christ. Now later, after both men left, the members of the church at uh, Corinth began to talk about Paul and Apollos. They had these fond memories Oh, I remember Paul. You remember Paul? Remember that time he told that joke and when he was preaching? <laughs> you remember this? You remember that? Uh, and, and then others said, well, no, I think Apollos had a, a bigger impact on my life. 
you know, pa Paul was good. Oh, he was okay. But Apollos was better. Uh, so some liked Apollos, some liked Paul more. So there, this dispute arose in the church as the members began to choose sides between Paul and Apollos. And that's when Paul found out about that. And so he wrote this letter. It's just one of the things that he addressed in the letter. There was a lot going on at Corinth. But this dispute over the pastors was one of the issues that he addressed. Now, here at the beginning of chapter 3, uh, Paul hit the members pretty hard. He told them that the reason they were having this dispute is because they were still spiritual babies. Listen to, listen to these words. They're pretty, pretty firm. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit of God because as people you are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for solid spiritual food. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. And since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Now you see what Paul is doing. He emphasizes that he and Apollos were simply servants that God was able to use in the church at Corinth. And God was able to use them because they were willing to be used. Now listen again at verse 5. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each his task. Now, this idea of servanthood and ministry doesn't just apply to Paul and Apollos. Every person who accepts the call of God on their life becomes a servant of the Lord. Is anybody here who has felt the call of God on your life to accept him as your personal savior? Uh, if that's happened in your life, that he expects you to be a servant as well. The church is most effective when every member realizes that each one is a servant and that God has assigned a task for you to perform as a member, as a part of his body, the church. Every member has a task to do. So what is the task for you? as a servant of the Lord? Well, it's whatever the Lord has assigned you to do. That's what Paul said. He said, we were just carrying out the responsibilities that God had given us. We were carrying out and performing the task that God had laid on us to do. And so every member of the church is a servant of the Lord. And every person who is a part of any church has responsibilities to serve the Lord in that church. God has a task for you to do. And I believe, I believe that God expects you to perform the task that he's assigned to you. Paul explained it this way over in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. From Christ the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And, and, and the body grows and builds itself up in love as each member does his work. The church grows because the members have accepted and are carrying out the task God has given them to do. And if every member doesn't accept or perform the task God has given you to do, the church doesn't grow the way God wants it to. See, it only works because everything is, everybody's doing their work. If you're a member of the church, 
then you are a servant of the Lord. And he has assigned you a task to perform in his service. The church is most effective. The church operates better. The church accomplishes its purpose when every member is busy doing the ministry that God has assigned you to do. Now look again at verse 6. Paul says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. You see, he was, he was explaining to them, I had a task to do. I had a responsibility to perform. I did my job. Apollos came along. He did his work. But it was God. It was God who made it grow. Now, Paul is saying here that there has to be diversity in the process of growing the church. Not everybody does the same thing in the church. In this case, one planted the seed, another watered it. He didn't say so, but apparently, uh, obviously, or somebody came along and cultivated that seed. Yet another may have been involved in bringing in the harvest. And all of those steps are important. God uses human instruments to present the gospel message to the world. And he does it through his church. And in his church, every member has something to do. God has a task for you to perform so that the church can function the way he designed it to function. But without the involvement of God, the efforts of man are futile. It is God who makes the gospel seed grow. God alone created the human heart. So it is God alone who can put a new heart in a human. God alone brought about the birth of every person. So it is God alone who can offer a second birth. God alone gave life to man. And so it is God alone who can provide eternal life to mankind. It's a responsibility of every servant, and that is every member of the church, to complete the task that God has assigned for you to do. But as you do your task, you have to remember that it's God who's going to make it grow. Now, Paul is also saying here that there has to be humility in the plan. Uh, listen to verse 7 again. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. You see, Paul and Apollos both understood that the role they played in the work of, the, of growing the church. But they also understood that without God's involvement, their work was useless. So it doesn't matter how hard you work, if God's not in it, it's not going to make any difference. But if it's God's plan for you, and the task that God has given you to do, and you're serving him through that task, then he is going to bless that effort. He's the one that's going to make that seed grow. They also understood that each one of them had a role to play in God's plan. And they knew that they had to have each other for the plan to be successful. And when there was a success, successful harvest, then every worker rejoiced regardless of the role they played in the process. Jesus said something about that over in John chapter 4. Listen to what Jesus said. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're right now into harvest. He's talking about spiritual harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper are glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. And when the harvest comes, everybody who had a part in that rejoices. It doesn't matter what your part was. 
if you've carried out your responsibility, if you fulfilled your purpose in God's work, then when the harvest comes, everybody rejoices. So there was diversity in the process. People were doing different things. There was humility in the plan. They recognized that they were nothing without God. But there was also unity in the purpose. Look again at verse 8. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. The church has one purpose. What is it? What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of our church? Why do we exist? Is it so we can come up here and listen to our great praise to him every week? Is it so we can come and hear the preacher give a 30, 40 minute talk? Is it so we can enjoy the fellowship that we enjoy with one another? Why are we here? What is our purpose? Well, let me answer it for you. The basic purpose of the church is to spread the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's why we are a church. That's why we're here. That's what God wants us to do. Now, one may plant a seed in somebody's heart. Someone else may come along and give a, a, a further word of encouragement that waters that seed. Someone else may pull out some weeds, point out some things in that person's life that you need to get out of that life. You, you may cultivate that. And it may be yet another person who comes along and at the right moment that person understands, yes, I need Christ and he's able to bring in that harvest. You see, it doesn't matter what role you played in the process. Everyone can rejoice when God's work is being done. The workers are not in competition with one another. There has to be unity in their purpose. Each one performing the task that God has assigned them to do. For the church to be successful today, today, there can be no such thing as an isolated ministry. I, I'm going to do my thing over here. Y'all do your thing. I'll just, I'll just be over here and everything is hunky-dory. You, you take care of your stuff. I'll take care of my stuff. That's not the way the church works. Everything we do, everything we do, from preaching to teaching Sunday school, to having children's ministry, to going to youth camp, to singing the worship songs. Everything must revolve around the same purpose. And that is to have the gospel message make an impact in the lives of people. That's why we're here. That's what we do. And verse 8 tells us that each one will be rewarded according to their own labor. Now let's notice what the reward is for. The reward is for the labor, the effort that you put in to serving the Lord in the task he's given you to do. The reward is not for being successful. Success is God's part. He's the one that provides the increase. He just expects us to faithfully do what he's assigned us to do. But when we all do what God has assigned us to do, then he brings in that harvest, and we all rejoice. God wants us to be unified in our purpose. God wants us to show humility in the plan, and God wants us to be diverse in the process of carrying out his work. And he wants us to get busy doing it. Listen, God's message 
is much more important than any human messenger. Doesn't matter who you are. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about carrying out God's purpose in our lives, fulfilling the task he's given us to do. It's the message, not the messenger. You know, we built our house a few years ago, and uh, our contractor was Jim Goodman. Now, uh, when somebody asks me, who built your house? I, I say, Jim, Jim Goodman built my house. And some of you know Jim. Uh, he's built several houses for members of ours. I think he's building Christie's in Jim. Yeah, he's building Kevin and Christie's house now. And several others of our members have used him uh, to get their houses built. So Jim, Jim Goodman built our house. But you know that in the whole process of that house being built down there, I saw him every few days. He was around there. Uh, it seemed like every time I went, he was there too. Uh, in that whole process, I don't ever remember Jim Goodman having a hammer in his hand. And I don't ever remember him taking a board to the saw and cutting it. He coordinated the work of all the different ones who were building that house. The cement guy got the slab poured. And the framers cut those two by fours and, and, and looked like tinker toys going up. The plumbers and the electricians came and did their part. The insulation was installed. The roofers got the shingles on. The painters came and did their thing. Now what do we say? I say, Jim Goodman built my house. But Jim Goodman did so by making sure that all those workers were doing the tasks they were assigned to do. And that house got built when everybody did their part. In the church, God's a contractor. God's got the plan. God wants to make sure that all the work gets done. That everybody's doing their job. That the tasks are being completed. He gives each one in the church a responsibility and he expects each one to carry out their work. Now, when that house was being built, several times during the process, things just stopped. What's going on? Nobody showed up to work today. Well, he explained it to me. We can't do anything else until this guy does his thing, and he's working, he's doing something else somewhere else. So we had to stop. Everything stopped until that guy could come and do what he had to do. And then everybody else could come in and do, carry the work on. In the church, everybody's got a task to do. And if you're not doing what God has assigned you to do, we're not making the progress we need to make. Things can just slow down or, or stop because God's waiting on you to do your thing. The very thing he has said is your responsibility. Do you know what God's assigned you to do? Are you doing it? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that you gave us to, to gather together to consider your plan for our church and how we all fit into your plan for the church to function properly with everybody performing their assigned task so that together we're able to
present the gospel message in ways that men and women and boys and girls can understand it and respond to it. Help us all to understand the role that we have to play in that process so that the work doesn't stop because we're not doing what we should be doing. Lead us through these moments of decision and dedication, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have another song now, and this gives you the opportunity to respond. God is speaking to you about some issue in your life. It has to do with your salvation, your church membership, maybe something else going on. You might be able to resolve it right where you are. You might need to come down and pray at this altar. I'll be glad to pray with you if I need to. But you respond to the Lord this morning. Maybe you've decided, you know what? I know God's got something else for me to be doing. I'm just not doing it. Didn't think I was equipped. Didn't think I was capable. But God keeps tugging at my heart. I know I know he's got something for me to do. I just need to decide to do it. God will open up that way that we sang about earlier. Because he's not going to have anything for you to do. That he's not going to equip you and prepare you to do. It all comes back to the willingness of your heart. Heart's not willing, your hands are not going to work. God is looking for willing hearts and working hands so that His church can achieve all that He has for us to do. You respond to the Lord if He speaks to you this morning. Let's stand and sing. Yeah.
to thank you again for being here, being a part of our uh, services uh, this morning at Crossroads. Remember, we have a Sunday school immediately after this worship service. We've got a place for everybody. Uh, we'll help you find that place. And then uh, 11 o'clock, we'll have our uh, more traditional service, and we look forward to God blessing us then uh, in that service as well. Uh, please remember, those of you who are members uh, tonight, we have a called business celebration at 6 o'clock. And uh, the, the only one thing to be settled tonight, and that is whether we would call uh, Kevin uh, to come back to church full time to be our associate pastor of preaching, discipleship, and Christian education. And so that's the question that we'll be answering tonight. Uh, I hope that you'll be here to participate in that discussion and, and uh, answer that question. And then uh, uh, if you'd like to, some more, we've got an information sheet. There's some in the foyer. There's some on the tables back here before you go up the stairs. And uh, if you would pick up one of these, it'll help you to understand a little bit better about what, what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. If you have questions, you can talk to someone, uh, one of our deacons or, or one, somebody on the personnel team. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, we want you to understand fully what what we're doing and, and why why we're doing it, and we believe that it's God's plan uh, for the our church going forward. And so, pick up one of these; that will help you. If you still got questions, chat with somebody. Uh, we will have time for questions and discussion tonight, and so we will look forward to seeing you uh, tonight at 6:30. Now, some of you need to be here at five o'clock. Five o'clock choir rehearsal, right well, here. Choir rehearsal. Choir rehearsal here in the sanctuary. Uh, if you've ever been in the choir, you're invited. If you've never been in the choir, uh, you're invited to come and participate in choir practice at 5 o'clock, uh, this business session celebration at 6 o'clock. And we, uh, people asked, and I said, sure, why not? Uh, people asked about bringing some food and having some fellowship time later. Uh, we'll do that as well. Uh, be sure if you're planning on staying, bring some food, enough for your family, a little bit to share, and uh, we'll be able to to have a little fellowship time after the business celebration tonight. Glad that you're here. Brother Anything John. Else? Yeah. A couple things. For our parents of students going to camp, we're going to have a meeting at 11 o'clock in the youth room. So after your Sunday school, come on down. We're going to work through the registration process. I'm going to have a couple computers out there where some of you can go ahead and get that knocked out. And then another session of our uh, men's Bible study will be at 4 p.m., correct, Mike? 4 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. And you don't have to have come at all before. Just come on. Um, it's been a good time with our men at 6.15 on Sunday mornings and then again at 4 o'clock in those afternoons. And we also have area of service where we need help. In our 11 o'clock service, we need some help in the sound booth. Uh, we'll train you. It's not hard, but we need help running the media shout and also could use some help running sound as well. So uh, if you could do that, see me, see Gala, uh, see Robert, and we'll, we'll get you plugged in. So. You know, COVID kind of messed us up for a year. And so we were able to do things kind of with a skeleton crew. And we had folks that were involved in those ministries that have moved. They're not here anymore. And so we really do need some help. It's not a complicated thing, but it does require somebody that's willing and somebody who's got some hands that are willing to work with them. Uh, and we'll, we'll help you to do that. Uh, what you experience in this service, we want our folks at 11 o'clock to experience also with the things on the screen and so forth. So we need, need some help there. Think about that. Pray about that. Let's see if God can use you in that way. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we're dismissed. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, the opportunity that you've given us to be here to experience your presence in worship. We pray, Father, that as we go out, we all consider what our role is in the life of your church, uh, what our uh, task is that you've assigned us to do individually and personally and help us to accept and carry out that work because we understand that until everybody's doing the thing that you have for them to do, our church is not going to function the way you want it to. Continue to bless us, Lord. Continue to lead us and help us to follow as you lead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One, two, three.